Welcome to this latest video where I will discuss how the downstream processing of enzymes in the pharmaceutical industry is handled. Uh, and enzymes, as they have a very particular 3 and 4D structure, that means that they're not quite as robust as some of the other materials that we work with. And that gives some complications in terms of the downstream processing, which I will discuss in this video. Now, first of all, you probably know this, but the function of an enzyme is basically a biological catalyst that speeds up the reaction. And it does that by lowering the activation energy in order to make a reaction happen. We have plenty of enzymes in our body, uh, but for the purpose of the pharmaceutical industry, we're also very interested in enzymes that occur in plants, animals, and microorganisms. And even though we know that these enzymes tend to work in a very narrow operating range, so specifically if we, we look at our body, which mostly uh, has like neutral pH and a temperature of 37, then we would imagine that those enzymes work the best under those conditions. However, we can approach directed evolution of enzymes, which means you can tailor the enzyme structure. And this has really helped to make these enzymes, for instance, work in organic solvents, but also work at, at different temperatures and pH ranges. So in that sense, you can really tailor the enzymes in terms of what you want. And a couple of these enzymes, which are quite often uh, used, are, are depicted here. Uh, so particularly lysozyme, which I'll talk about later, uh, lactase, and there's a couple of a range of enzymes that are used also for pharmaceutical applications. Now, a big concern when it comes to the downstream processing is that your enzyme might cause allergic reactions. And that's definitely the case for lysozyme, uh, because when people have an allergy to eggs, this can also be caused by this lysozyme. Uh, and that's why, even though it's uh, often used as a food additive, you need to make sure that there's not too much in it. Uh, there can be toxic products, so some endotoxins, which I'll also get back to later. And you might be concerned about pathogenic microorganisms that actually in the, the, in the process are introduced and are not fully removed. So it's very important, this, this um, downstream processing, also in terms of the safety and the product specifications. So what does a general downstream processing uh, for enzyme look like? And then I'll go over two specific examples, which you'll see are quite different. Now, first of all, as I mentioned, the critical bit of this is to retain the enzymatic activity. Uh, and that kind of limits the options that you have. Uh, and we can look at quality by design principles, about which I have a separate video, which have been introduced in order to make sure that the quality of the product is maintained uh, throughout uh, the process itself. And it looks at, for instance, some critical process parameters um, that are important in order to achieve this. And an inbuilt quality, that's what this quality by design is. But for more information, have a look at the other video I made about this. But the first step is that you need to look at uh, whether your enzyme is uh, made in the cell or extracellular. Right? Because if it's made in the cell, which is quite common, then you need to introduce like a cell lysis stage in order to get your enzyme out of the cell. And by far the most common still remains homogenization because it's very fast uh, and it doesn't really introduce damage to the enzymes itself. Um, but there's a couple of other options that you might employ. For other products, actually this um, mechanical removal or sonications are far more common than for instance homogenization. So there's a couple of options there. Then we get to the recovery, which is like a type of extraction of a crude product where you need to remove the cell debris uh, and other things uh, because can you imagine that you lyse the cell? So there's a lot of other products. There's, uh, for instance, a DNA that remains behind which you want to remove. And this is typically done either with a series of filtration steps or centrifugation. And then finally, then we have the polishing step uh, where you can see chromatography is really the workhorse uh, in, in that respect. Uh, and you might want to look at viral activation depending on uh, what type of microorganism that you work with. Um, precipitation and crystallization are also options and I have a separate video on crystallization. So if you look at chromatography, the, the choice of the stationary phase is critical uh, and that's why often they use a train of chromatography steps. Um, so here you can see, for instance, it talks about affinity chromatography um, I will show later an example of where you look at separation based on charges. So there's a lot of different steps that you might employ there. But now have a, a look at two uh, examples, which might give you like a better of idea what actually happens in this downstream processing. And the first one I want to go over, which I've mentioned before, is lysozyme. 
very important compound because it has antiviral, antibacterial and antifungal properties. So in essence, it's a natural uh, type of antimicrobial compound, which is why it's often used as a food additive, uh, but it has a lot of other uh, applications as well. However, if you look at lysozyme, the ori origin where it comes from, for instance, if you look at hen egg or whether it comes from different sources, it can have very different structures. And that also means that the isoelectric point can be very different. Um, so depending on what this is, you really have to tailor uh, particularly your chromatography step. And we'll see that if they looked at, they looked at the, a series of steps that were employed. And here you can roughly see how this was modeled, where they looked at grinding. So they got it out of the cell. So this is a slice step. Extractions and liquid, liquid separation uh, and a few other uh, polishing steps. And then finally, concentration and biofiltration before drying and obtaining the final product. And actually the most of the material was lost in the concentration filtration step, which is all the way at the end. So that is just something uh, to bear in mind. What's absolutely critical uh, in terms of the downstream processing is the cation exchange chromatography. And this is where this isoelectric point becomes quite uh, an important matter, uh, because depending on what this is, you need to tailor the properties that you have for that. And downstream processing is a very uh, costly process, which is why you want to potentially model uh, different options. And in this case, it's with a super pro designer in order to work out uh, what's the best option. So, and here they can see, and this is key to bear in mind, that even though the chromatography is absolutely critical in order to get to the pure product, um, so there it went from a very low yield to more than 90% uh, yield of the pure product, it's also by far the most costly step, like a 45% cost. So you really need to carefully think about all the steps. And for instance, the drying of something, if you can avoid it because of the cost of the energy, that would be important to bear in mind. Um, but the previous one on lysosome, I wanted to give another example as tannase, uh, which is not quite as common, I've got to say. And these are natural polyphenolic compounds. So again, like lysosome, you have a whole range of tannases that you can work with. And it could be that you have to adapt the full process to whatever that you're working with. And so far, this product is actually mainly used in teas, uh, but it's also used for the production of gallic acid. So in the diagram, you, see, you can see a couple of substrates uh, that tannase actually works on, so it can depolymerize and it can form gallic acid, uh, which is an important application. So here we look at a similar steps, uh, but it works slightly differently. So the recovery is quite different because actually tannase is one that's most often produced extracellularly, uh, which means that you have less concerns around the cell debris that you have to remove. Um, the next step would be concentration, where people either look at precipitation versus ultrafiltration, which are the two most common methods. Uh, but bearing in mind, if you saw that from the previous slide, the concentration step is actually where you lose a lot of the material. And then finally, the purification, where again, you look at a series of chromatographic techniques. Uh, so here, where the previous one, cation exchange is the most common here, there's a few other options to consider. And I thought this is a, a nice diagram. Um, this is not even a fully complete one, there's a whole range, which shows what kind of options that you have. Um, so you can see whatever source or whatever microorganism that you use has a big impact on the downstream processing. So here, I said mainly it's produced extracellulary, but there are some examples where it's produced intracellulary, and so where you need that additional uh, step where you need to lyse the cells. Um, but there's a lot of different options thrown around here, so different chromatographic techniques, precipitation, extraction, and it all depends on what microorganism that you work with. So a key consideration that you need to make is between uh, the purification, so how pure do you actually need to get your product, versus the recovery and actually the costs that come with it. And that might determine what type of process that you follow. But a key factor then is the quality control. So you've done your DSP, but how do you actually figure out that you have the pure material that you're working with? Uh, and similarly to quality by designs and other things, this is conducted under the regulations of good manufacturing uh, practice, or GMP. So the quality control methods that are recognized by the FDA, they mainly look at the identity, the purity, the potency, which is also linked to the strength and the safety of your product. So if you look at an enzyme, the identity can be done with peptide mapping, are usually done with mass spec, and it's first to figure out that we actually have made the correct enzyme. 
Then the purity, you can look at techniques like HPLC or SDS page, which are very important. But if you want to make sure that the DNA is fully removed, then you need to look at PCR. For the potency and the strength, and this is where I say it's critical that your enzyme structure is not impacted, you can do enzymatic assays to check the potency and the strength of your material and whether this wasn't impacted by the processes that you put it through. And then finally, the safety is a very important um, concern. So I mentioned the presence of endotoxins, which you can determine with an LIA test. And if you wonder what this what looks like blue blood is there, I actually showed how uh, in a previous video how they use the horseshoe crab, which has some very distinct properties in order to determine endotoxins. Uh, and that will also explain why you see that blue material here. And you need to look at the presence of other harmful microorganisms. So you don't want any bacteria or any other viruses that remain behind in the product. Um, so this is obviously even though quality control are separate from the DSP, these two are very closely linked and you need to be aware of that. Um, because you might need to adapt your DSP if you find that, for instance, the purity is not high enough or that your enzymatic activity is not being retained. Thanks for watching this video and if you do want to learn more about other downstream processing in the pharmaceutical industry, we have a, co a couple of other videos on, for instance, the processing of monoclonal antibodies and a couple of other content. Thanks for watching.